Welcome everyone to Shara Bitachan. I'm your host, Chai Ben Shimon. Uh, we always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem, God, is going to give to us. So let's give generously. So Hashem will give us give generously. I'm going to put some coins in the Sedaka box. We're dedicating this class, this series, in merit for the complete safety for Rafael Ben Dvorlea. He's a commander in, in the IDF in Israel, and he is fighting Hashem's war. And we together will keep him safe and all the Chayalim safe. And we should bring the hostage, hostages home immediately. We're going to do Psalm Chaf, Kapitel Chaf, so join me from home. Lam Natseach Mizmar le David, Yancha Adinai Biyan Sarah, Yisagevcha Shem Elehe Yakai, Yishlach Ezracha Mikaidesh, Umitsian Yisadecha, Yiskarko Minchaisecha, Dailascha Yidash Nasela, Yitain Lacha, Chova Vavcha, Vecho Atascha Yimale, Naranana Bishua Secha Ubishem Elehinu Nigo. Yimalea denai komisha secha ata yedeti ki haishia denai mishihaya neu mishme kachai bitfuresi shayiminai. Ela varechev ve ela vasusim va nachnu vishem adenai lehenu naskir. Hema karo vina falu va nachnu kamnu vinisaidad adenai hashia hamelech yanenu viam karenu. I'm now going to introduce you to Vorle Andrusier, our incredible teacher of Sharbi Tachan. Thank you for being here. Hi, good evening, everybody. It's great to be back. Um, thank you, Chaya, for saying uh, the Pasuk of Tehillim, Parak of Tehillim, for Rafal and for also all the soldiers and all the hostages. I'm in a particularly missing him space, so I'm wearing my Miss You sweatshirt. Um, he went in this past Sunday, and we have not heard from him. Uh, this morning, gratefully, we got a very funny message from some Israeli phone number and said, hi, I am friend Rafa. He says he is good and he miss you. And I looked up and I forwarded the message to our whole family. So everyone has the good news. And I said, thank you, Hashem. But it was the first time for that long of a time that we didn't have any communication. So I'm grateful and feeling significantly stronger this morning after getting that message. Although my bitachan is front and center, just that little confirmation definitely did feel good. So before we start the introduction to Shara Bitachan, Rabbi Bachya also goes through as to whether or not bitachan in and of itself is an actual mitzvah in the Torah. So there are many different mefarshim, many different explanations to this, and I'm going to go through all of them because it's important when you're reading a book such as this or any any classic book, there always has to be sourcing so that you don't think, you know, this wonderful rabbi from a thousand years ago had all these lofty ideas, but we need to know that they're sourced in Torah in order for it to be a classic. So the first is the Vilna Gon, and he says that bitachon is not a specific mitzvah, but it's rather a mitzvah that somewhat hovers over all the other mitzvahs and it allows us to be able to fulfill mitzvahs with much more meaning and much more understanding. The Rambam, who was one of the only to address every single one of the 613 mitzvahs in a sefer, in a book, he writes about Bitachan that it is not one of the 613 mitzvahs. Rabbi Yona says that it is actually part of the negative commandments. And where does it say that? In Parshas Devarim, it says, if you go out to war, which is very prevalent to us today, if you go out to war and you see a nation that is bigger and more powerful than you, do not be afraid. You cannot fear the army. So here, firstly, that's who we are as the Jewish people. Um, we had this during the Maccabees. We were many, we were few, they were many. We were able to vanquish our enemy. And please, God, Amir Sashem, the exact same thing will happen now in Eretz Yisrael. So it's very relevant to us today when we see the IDF preparing to go into a certain location. Um, they're, they're with their whole group and they're ready to go in on their mission. What are they doing? You see the commander standing in the center or in the circle with them. And they're singing songs of faith and hope. They're not going in worried. They're not going in with fear, they are going in with passion and with excitement because they know that what they are doing 
every moment is al Kiddush Hashem to sanctify God's name and to keep the Jewish people alive and with our holy land. So by not fulfilling a negative commandment to not be afraid, that is where the Ramban, um, Rabbeinu Yonah shows us that it is actually one of the mitzvahs, the negative commandments of do not be afraid. That means if we are afraid, we don't have complete bitachon. Now I want to reference back to the fact that bitachon is not an all or nothing. And I want you to keep that front and center in your minds because when we start to judge ourselves, oh my goodness, today my bitachon isn't great. Today my tachon bitachon is down here. What is this all worth? It's not working. One day I'm here, one day I'm here. That's life, my dear people. Life is one day here and one day there. But when we start to feel the trust, it actually helps us when we're going, like we feel we're on a roller coaster with the ups and downs. Having that trust allows us to better get through it in a different way. Another explanation is that we are told to fear Hashem. We fear, what is the fear that we have? We're supposed to have Ahava and Yira of God. We are supposed to love and fear God. And I know a lot of people have an aversion to the word fear when they're talking about Hashem. They want to think of their God as a kind and loving God. So the word that I use in, in, in lieu of fear is reverence. We have reverence for Hashem. When it says, do not fear, because Hashem is here, and Hashem has the ability, when we understand that Hashem has the vast ability to do anything and everything, that is bitachon. So he also agrees that it is a mitzvah, but part of the negative commandments. The Ramban, Nachmanides, says that it's a positive mitzvah commandment. And he learns it in the Torah where it says to not seek out astrologers to, to tell you the future. Jewish people are not supposed to go to others for future for fortune telling. Why? Firstly, on a simple human level, when someone tells me something and I pay for it and I believe that they have some sort of power, I am going to now limit myself to what that person told me, whereas Hashem is limitless. So if we believe that if we go to this astrologer and they're going to tell me something, I am essentially saying I'm taking the crown off of Hashem. We can only have one king with one crown at a time everywhere and anywhere and and especially in our celestial heights so what i'm essentially doing is i'm taking the crown off of god and i'm putting it on something else and i'm saying this is what's going to tell me what's going to be so here also it's a negative commandment not to seek out astrologers and it proves to us how bitachon is a uh, is an actual mitzvah in the torah the kina seifram says how can daily torah not be a biblical commandment. In the Torah, it says that the intent of prayer is where we ask Hashem to fulfill our needs. So we were commanded to pray, but we're supposed to trust. So we talked about this a little bit in lesson one, that although we know whether we deserve it or not, Hashem is taking care of us, we still have to put in the effort every single day. We have to do everything in our humanly, humanly, human power and at that point, I'm able to say, Hashem, I have given this, whatever this is, everything I've got, I really have. I'm, I'm, I'm checking with myself and making sure that that's a true statement. And now I am giving it over to you because my, my shoulders can't carry that burden anymore. But for you, it's nothing. So now we're going to begin with introduction to Shara Bitachon. Okay, and it starts like this, so I'm going to be reading from inside the book. Those of you who have it can follow along. How I do it in my classes in person is somebody in the class reads, and then we flush out the idea. So here it says, I'm placing our trust in God alone. The author's introduction. Having previously discussed in the previous gate the obligation to accept the service of God, I have seen it to be appropriate now to explain that which is most necessary for a person who wishes to be a servant of God, and that is to rely on him for all his matters. For by doing so, there will be great benefits both in Torah matters and in worldly matters. 
So here it's just continuing to talk about all the ways that bitachon is going to serve us. And we're going to shortly go into a list of what those things are. Among the Torah benefits is tranquility of the soul, which is free of worry as a result of reliance of God, just as a servant who is bound to place his trust in his master. So back in the day, there were servants and the master was the one who provided for that servant. Granted, the man or the woman was a servant in the master's home, but because the master took care of all of their needs, all they had to do was the job that they were told to do. Lodging, shelter, food, everything was taken care of for them by their master. So it's very easy for them in a world where Hashem is very much concealed to think to themselves, this master is what is bringing me joy or sadness, happiness or pain. Everything is coming from this master. And we know that with a Jewish a servant, a Jewish maidservant or a Jewish servant, after seven years, a master has to allow a Jewish servant to go free. If that Jewish servant says, I want to stay with this master, even though I'm working hard and I'm getting paid very little, what I know, this is how humanity believes and feels and thinks, what I know, even if it's not great, feels much safer and easier to me than something out there that's unknown. So this person wants to stay a servant. What happens? We have to nail their ear to the doorpost because a Jewish person is supposed to have one master. And if this Jew says after seven years, I want to continue being a servant, they have to have this awareness of this person is only able to help you and take care of you because God allows it. But because you have put, pulled God out of the picture, you no longer need Hashem because you have this master. Hashem will allow us to believe that whatever we focus on and believe is going to bring us joy, that is what Hashem will allow us to believe. So for everybody, it's something different. It could be social media. When I'm popular on social media, then my life will be good taking the crown off of Hashem, putting it on social media. When I make X amount of dollars, then I'm going to be happy. Taking the crown off of God, putting it on money or status or political correction. All of the things that we do, it says that if we do that, Hashem in, in the book, it says Hashem removes his countenance from us. But we just talked about that Hashem never removes his countenance from us. Well, what does that actually mean? is that as long as I'm involved in that behavior, striving to get here or to this friend group or to this place in time or in space, he's going to allow me to believe that until I myself realize I'm working diligently to get with this friend group. And I finally made it like Eureka. The moment is here. I'm friends with this group. And I'm like, what just happened? Like I have been working towards this goal. I'm now here. I've arrived and there's nothing here. This is nothing of what I thought it would be because the only one who is able to give us and to understand us better than we can or give ourselves is God. To continue inside the book, for a person who does not place his trust in God and places his trust in another entity, so that's a continuation of what we just talked about. If a person places his job in something other than God, then God removes his divine providence from him and leaves him in the hands of the other entity in which he placed his trust. So that we just talked about. The person who places his trust in something other than God will be like one regarding whom it is said, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the spirit, for the spring of, from the spring of living waters to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that do not hold water. And as the verse says, they exchange their glory for the likeness of an ox eating grass. So what is he talking about here? He says, he says, the Jewish people hurt me twofold. They left me because we leave Hashem 
over and over and over again. We leave Hashem. This pasuk that he's talking about is we left Hashem, and not only did we leave him, but we left him for broken cisterns. What broken cisterns is he referring to? So here in the pasuk, it says that he's talking about an ox eating grass. What was the ox eating grass? The Jewish people Hashem made miraculous, not within nature miracles. Hashem split the sea. First, he did the 10 plagues in Egypt. Then he split the sea. Then they walked through the desert. They had manna. They had the holy clouds protecting them. Everything that the Jewish people needed, God provided for them. Then they're surrounding and at the base of Harsinai, waiting to receive the Ten Commandments. And they miscalculate the time of Moshe's coming down from heaven. They decide, that's it. He's gone. And what do they do? They immediately reach out for a golden calf to dance around this golden calf. And although the Jewish people had the proper intention, they knew they needed a conduit, someone to be the shliach for them to God, because God is too powerful. But they, they left Hashem, and they left him for something that was absolutely empty and nothing and worthless. Now we continue. And the verse says, Blessed is the man who relies on the Lord, and the Lord will be his support. So this just continues. The more that we trust Hashem in the good moments, people feel to themselves, okay, so in the good moments, it's significantly easier to trust Hashem. But if we sit back and we go over like a time period, when things are going well, many of us completely forget that God exists at all. Those who pray rush through their prayers, but like, I'm the success. I'm the one who managed to achieve X, Y, or Z, and we forget about God. When we're in suffering or in challenge, we do tend to reach out to God, but it's in a way of, like we talked about, anger, frustration. How could you do this to me? Why me? So I often say to people, when something hard comes, we all say, why me? Do you wake up in the morning when things are calm and beautiful and good in your home and say, Hashem, why me? No, because when things are good, when things are working as they're supposed to, we we just take it for granted. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of the study that we're doing here is learning not to take anything for granted. Everything that we have in light in our life is by divine consent and from Hashem. So we can't take anything for granted. In addition to being a makritov, recognizing the good that someone outside of ourselves does for us, being for ourselves, being in a space of gratitude, having a gratitude consciousness saves our lives because we then continue to look for more things to be grateful for. Now we're continuing in the book and it says, as it says, Fortunate is the man who has made the Lord his support and did not turn to the haughty and those who turn to falsehood. So here, what they're, what he's talking about is very often we, we have two things that humanity needs and craves. We crave authenticity. We want to be who we truly are. We want to be able to show the person opposite us to really see us, not just, you know, this face or this outfit that I'm wearing today, I want you to see me and I want you to know me and my values. And the other deep need that humanity has is connection. Very often, in order to maintain connection, we have to pull back on our authenticity. So if I'm going to say something to someone because I believe it's what's right and connected, but if I say that to the person, even if I, and I'm supposed to say it with grace and with kindness, but if I'm going to say that to another person, there is a potential that that person is not going to want to be my friend anymore. And if I'm so desperate for that connection, I'm not going to speak my truth. When we have bitachin, it allows for a space of, I know if I'm, if I'm, we have to check with ourselves because just to critique someone because you feel like it is not right. 
and is not our responsibility and is something that we should veer away from. But when I'm in a close friendship with someone and I see that they're doing something that isn't what's best for them, I'm comfortably able to say it to them because if they don't want to be my friend anymore because of that, I know that I did what was right and Hashem is going to take care of me and make sure that whatever I need as far as friendship, I will have. It gives us permission to share with people where we would normally hold back. Now to continue, as it says, cursed is the man. Okay, so we're on page seven for all those who are following along in the book on the right-hand side. And it says, cursed is the man who relies in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So again, it's just repeating the same thing is that if we go towards another space, we are actually removing ourselves from Hashem. Now in Tanya, it says, in the moment that we do or trans, when we transgress a sin, in that moment, we are a complete Russia. If in the very next moment I do teshuva, in that moment, I am a complete tzaddik. So what we do when you say, you know, how important is that really? Everything that we do and every word that comes out of our mouth needs to be with thought and to process before. Hashem gave us the gift of teeth and lips so that before something comes out of my mouth, the same way we're careful kosher-wise, health-wise about what comes into our mouth, we need to be careful about what comes out of our mouth. Um, okay, we're continuing now also page seven under misguided trust. If he relies on his wisdom, his schemes, and his physical strength, and his own efforts, his efforts will be for naught. He will become weak and lose that physical strength, and his schemes and wisdoms will fall short of accompanying his goods, his goals. And the verse says, he traps clever people in their shrewdness. And it says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race does not belong to the swift, nor does the word to the mighty, and the wise do not have bread. So here what he's saying is he's telling us all of the benefits of having bitachan. Because we could say, well, I'm super smart. I'm very strong. I have all of these talents. I can accomplish, I can accomplish, I can accomplish on my own. No, we cannot. And the more that we continue, we talked about a gratitude to conscious. In this book, what we are trying to create for ourselves is a God consciousness and a Bitachon consciousness. Because when I have a God and Bitachon consciousness front and center in my head, my entire day looks different. Anything that happens that's hurtful in any way doesn't feel as hurtful because there's an understanding. I needed to hear that. That person said something to me, I needed to hear it. Now the responsibility is on me. Okay. What about that felt true? Did anything that just she said to me just now that was hurtful, often when someone says something that hurts us, it's because there's something inside of us that we know we need to work on. Also, there are times that someone will say something hurtful and you, you do that accounting for yourself and you say, this actually has nothing to do with me. It's a, it's a her problem or it's a him problem and they need to deal with it. But the heat of like that first instinct of, oh, She's such a not nice person. I can't believe she talks that way. It's like, if it happens, I was meant to experience it. God allowed it to happen. So I have a different reaction towards it. Now, do I have a different reaction towards it every single time? No, because then I wouldn't be human. We're, we're human. God created a perfect world imperfectly. He created humanity because he gave us free choice. He had the angels up in heaven. The angels complained and screamed and yelled when Hashem said that he wanted to create humanity. They said, here we are. We do your bidding all day. Whatever you want, we do. And God said, you were created. Each angel was created with a specific responsibility and they can't veer away from their responsibility. So them serving God is not that they chose to serve God. They were created to serve God. We, on the other hand, our neshama is here to serve God, but enclosed in a body, we are, it's very easy for us 
to put our attentions elsewhere. Um, this weekend, we spent Shabbos at Jewish Recovery Weekend, which, you know, a lot of people look at the world of mental health and addiction as the fringe part of our society, you know, the ones we don't necessarily want to have anything to do with. And we've been going there for many, many years. And I walked away from this weekend and I said, I truly believe that that sector of society, that sector of our Jewish people who are real, who are in active recovery, there is only complete trust in God because without God, they can't break out of the prison that they put themselves in. So one of the men came over to me and, and asked me a question about how do I maintain myself inside and still be able to relate to the world outside when so much of the outside world is not on par with the values that I have. And what I said to him was, and it, it, like, it just came to me, so I am thanking Hashem because when something just comes to me, it's not mine. And I thought of it like this. There's a little neshamala up in heaven. And that neshama does not want to come down here into this dark world of ugly behaviors. He wants to stay with Hashem and the angels. But finally, Hashem sends this neshamala down. And we are the chariot. I look at the neshama as like the king who drives in the most beautiful chariot. So our body is the chariot for our neshama. We have to then, I have to take care of my body. My body is important. I have to make sure that my body is healthy and nourished. And I have to make sure that my humanness is nourished by connecting with other people. So the image for him and for me, like we actually felt it like this beautiful little neshamala being carried around in our chariot, but we're united. It's not the chariot is one entity and the neshama is another. We're interlaced. And without the neshama, the body doesn't exist. My, my bubby, Bubby Rachel, one of the women that this class is in memory of, when she passed away, my granddaughter, who's seven years old, said to her mother, I understand that Hashem needed Bubby's neshama. But why couldn't he leave her body on the blue couch so we could spend time with her? And from a little seven-year-old, it was such a cute, meaningful story. But I thought about it. That's how we think. It may not be what we know. We know that our neshama and our body are one. But the way that we behave on a daily basis, the way that we interact on a daily basis is my neshama, okay, I'm going to tap into my neshama when I'm listening to somebody do a word of Torah. I'm going to tap into my neshama when I go on to Chaya's weekly Zoom class. But when I'm living my life, I'm living my physical life. No, her story brought it so clearly. Without the neshama, the body is nothing. So we have to take care of our body and we have to take care of our neshama. And this is where we are going to end today. This will be lesson three of Shara Bitahan. Thank you to Oralea. And we do this class in memory of our dear grandmothers, Rifka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda and Rachel Bela Bas Shneer Zaman. I would also like to share a beautiful words that the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe said on Bitahan. And here goes. When a person finds himself in a situation where the light of day has given way to gloom and darkness, one must not despair. God forbid, on the contrary, it is necessary to fortify oneself with complete trust in God, the essence of goodness, and take and take heart in the firm belief in the darkness is only temporary, and it will soon be superseded by a bright light. An expert from the letter addressed to all Jewish detainees. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Chaya Mink. That's, you go to YouTube, click on C-H-A-Y-A-M-I-N-K, subscribe for many incredible past classes and future classes. Thank you very, very much and looking forward to our next class.